Okay, so welcome everyone to this live session. Today we are here with artists, not only from the Language of Color workshop, but also we open it up to artists in general. And we wanna make this just a casual talk on the topic of what is it to be your own best teacher after we answer just a couple of questions coming in regarding the workshop. So we wanted to kind of expand a little bit on the idea of the coffee and tea YouTube videos and uh, have a chat with you all. Um, we're happy to have you here and hear from you. So let's begin. Let me just check in here with a couple of questions and then we'll carry it from there. So Mark from Adrian and Adrian is with us. So yes. Adrian, you wanna ask your own question or you want me to read it? Uh, you. Great, hi. You read it. Hi. So would you like- Hello. Yes. Um, Mark added a lighter color to a darker color. I and I'm not a painter. Can why would you add a lighter color to a darker color to get a range of hues rather than the dark to the light? Great question. You can go both ways, so I'll discuss briefly. If you take a dark color like a dark blue or blue green, whatever, and you add varying degrees of white to that color you're going to see the value become lighter and lighter and lighter over a period of time. And you're gonna see that what we call the gradation of value from dark to light. And that's just one way of going in that direction and in that spectrum, you see? So you'll be able to see that progression. But your question is great, Adrian, because of course you can do it the other way. You can start with white, add, small amounts of blue or whatever color you're playing with and watch it go darker gradually. Now, I will also say that one of the great ways to get what I call off whites, which are light colors that are just barely down below white is just that. Start with white and add small amounts of whatever color you want and you get this beautiful range of what I call off white colors. The reason in the exercise we go the other way around partly is just to, it is to go from dark to light in that direction. Oh. You also uh, use this paint this way. <laughs> if you wanted to get, for instance, um, what I call a half tone of a blue, it's better to start with the dark and add a little bit of white because you're gonna use less paint. But your question is perfect. You can go both ways. Thank you. Then. Yes. And sometimes we do have that um, question, for example, I know when we go from, uh, how was it for the compliments? The, yes. the yellow and the violet. That's right. always interesting because, right. yeah, you can. Explain. So a lot of people ask when you get to the point of uh, experimenting with complementary colors, let's say you're going to play with yellow versus violet. Well, the way we do it is to start with yellow and add small amounts of violet to that yellow and it gradually goes darker and all kinds of colors happen and values. Someone said, well, why can't we do it the reverse? Why can't you start with violet and add yellow and go the other way? Well, you can do that, but you'll go through paint. Mm -hmm. It takes longer because the violet has a stronger tinting strength. And so, yes, you can go the other way. You'll just, it'll take you longer and you'll use more paint, but there's nothing wrong with doing it. Yeah. Great question. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, Adrian. And then the question from Tina, Dale. So Tina, if you want to unmute your mic, you can jump in. Uh, her question is, can we talk about underpainting colors. colors? Sure. Are you there, Tina? Do you want to jump in? If you want, if you want. If not, you if can. No, I'll just answer. Yeah. Oh, there she is. Hi. Hi, Tina. Nice to see you. Hi, Tina. Nice to see you and love, love, love your workshop. Thank you so much. Where are I'm you? I'm totally. Pardon where are, me? Where are you calling from, Tina? I'm calling from Northern Alberta, where it's 33 below zero this morning. And I'm, yesterday was minus 40. Woo. <laughs> really hard because I have a, a friend in Manitoba and she posted on Facebook that he was 36 and with wind chilled minus 51. And I told Mark that's a minus and 100 and what, 23 degrees. And Mark is like, <laughs> you don't go out, right? <laughs> not much and not for long. Well, you know, you, you can from the garage to the car to from the car to the store, you know, but you don't tell. But some people are actually walking in the snow. It's beautiful. It's an absolute gorgeous, gorgeous um, morning, sunshine, 
and cold. <laughs> like the snow, so it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, yes. Another question. It's a wonderful question about underpainting colors. Now, did you have yeah. a question because, or is it general? Well, no, I'm, I'm a watercolorist, really and truly. That's where I've come from. And I've never been, I've always been fascinated with um, the underpainting that peeks right through in acrylics and, and oils. And that's what I'm trying to figure out. Uh, but that's what I love is that little, peekaboo things um, and that makes it sparkle. And so how do you choose um, <clears throat> those colors based on what we're talking about, you know, um, <clears throat> or maybe it's a totally outside of the, the workshop, I don't know. Not, not really, but there's no specific, uh, there's no specific recipe for this. Or you know, I can speak to it in general terms and it may help you and others. Um, I, I was an undergraduate student years ago what my assistant teacher used to make these beautiful paintings and they were uh, almost photorealist paintings of, you know, when you go to a stream of water and you see the rocks in the water and they have these beautiful colorations. Yeah. Those were his paintings and he started, he was painting in oils. So he would let them dry and then do many glazes. He would start with very intense, bright, bright colors, bright yellows, oranges, greens, you name it. It looked almost like psychedelic bright. And that was his uh -huh. with these rocks, you see. Right. And gradually, he would lay thin layers or washes or glaze, as we call them, of other colors. And eventually, they became to look like rocks. But this other, this undercolor was coming through, you see, because he did it so uh, gradually and thinly. So I think that's the best answer I have for you. So let's say if you had a, an underpainting of bright, intense yellow or yellow orange, and you're laying thin layers of blue of some sort, yeah. you're getting wonderful gradations of green, but you have to be careful not to overdo it or you lose that underpainting. Got it, okay, fair enough. I'm, I will have to experiment. Yes. The other question I have though, with all these paints and all the swatches and all, we're always adding white. Now, I think intellectually, I think I've, I've got the answer, but I wanna confirm it. We're not talking about adding black, but I know that I can add black if I add the two, three primaries. So uh, can you expand on that a little bit? In terms of adding black versus white? I'm not sure if I understand you. No, no, no. Um, I, I can understand by you know revealing the color, you add white more and more and more and doing the swatches. You're always talking about adding white, but there was only a couple of, um, uh, exercise where we added black. So when you're doing things, do we add uh, adding black versus adding the three primaries, let's say to tone it down sort of thing. Right, so let's go back to white first of all, because the other way to reveal a color and to lighten it is just to use more of the medium. In your case, you're a watercolorist. So yes. obviously the moment you start adding more and more uh, liquid to your colors in the same way, right acrylic or oil, that also will lighten the value and loosen the intensity or diminish the intensity. So there's that. In, in terms of taking a color down in value, I seldom yep. use, when I do use black to do that, I only do it with certain colors. I uh -huh. do yellows and the yellow oranges and the oranges because I get beautiful earth, uh, earth tone from that. I will also do it to the yellow greens and the lighter greens because again, I get some very beautiful colors. If I add black to a color that's already fairly dark, like a blue green or a red orange, it doesn't work as well. It, 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 you get certain colors and they may, they, you may like them, but they start to kind of muddy out for me personally. So in that case, then I would mix my own blacks and I can make those blacks warm or cool. And that's right. the key knowing how to make a warm black and a cool black. That way you can control not only the temperature, but the vibrancy of a color. Okay, well, thank you so much. That really explains it. Good, thank you. Nice thank to you, see you, Tina. Tina. Okay, we have one more question from Tim. Hi, Tim. Hello, Tim. If Always, you good, to, are here, always yes. good to see Tim. What <laughs> are your uh, top picks for making the transition from oil to acrylic? Is it just practice. Right. So transitioning from oil to acrylic. Mm -hmm. Tim, are you there? Do you want to join in? I am. Uh, yes. Now I've been, I've moved on to acrylics doing your swatches. I'm more used to watercolor and oils. Yes. And now I'm trying to convert what I'm learning about the color mixing 
into my painting, but I'm struggling to get the more subtle effects, the more gentle transitions. Yeah. Um, oh boy! <laughs> oh boy, Tim, you, you got me here on this one. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna yes, I'm gonna, a little confession here. Uh, I was, as a young artist, suckled on oils. You know, they they were they were my mother of colors, right? The oils, and that's what I was. That's what I trained with for years. I used oils. And I love oil paints. And I teach oil painting at the college. And a lot of my students are terrified of using oils. And relatively quickly, I sort of demystify it for them. And then many of them fall in love. You cannot, in my, in my opinion, Tim, you cannot get the same vibrancy of color, this um, nuance and just lusciousness of color with acrylics as you can. I'm there, I've said it. Uh, <laughs> so there's no hope. <laughs> Sorry, just give it up. Just give it up. Uh, go back to oils. Uh, and I would if I could, but for health purposes mm-hmm. and such, because I live where I work, uh, I have transitioned. And also because I work with mixed media, where I'm working with paper and glue, and you know, as you as you know, oil and water don't mix. Uh, here's my advice, however worth with acrylics and now I'll give you hopefully a better answer. Um, I find myself liking oils when I work with them thick. When I, excuse me, acrylics. When I work with acrylics and it gets fairly thick, it is plastic after all. It's not, you know, it's plastic. So it has that kind of dull plasticky quality. Now you can buffer that up with varnishes after you're done as well as cold wax and that will bring out more of the uh, vibrancy, Tim, of that color. Right. That when I work with thin layers of acrylic, they're more vibrant uh, when when they transition from one to the next. And also, if you start with a very, very white surface, that's going to help too. Thin layers of, of your acrylics, the white surface will really bring up some beautiful saturation with acrylics. So that in conjunction with the mediums, experimenting with different mediums will also enhance the saturation, Tim, or the vibrancy of acrylic. Um, And then finally this, for what it's worth, you can start a painting with acrylic and then go back over with oil. You can go oil on top of acrylic. You cannot reverse that, but you can do that well. You just can't stay away from it. Right. (laughs) Any medium you'd recommend, because that's where I'm going at the moment, is trying to get the control. I feel with oil, I have control. With acrylic, I feel it's a bit bit like wearing hobnail boots. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it depends on what you liked uh, as a look. You know, I I don't prefer a glossy look, although some people do. So they have have so many mediums, it's almost overwhelming. It's like trying to buy a toothpaste these days. So my own personal preference is matte medium, but some people feel that the matte medium kind of dulls the color. Mm. Um, It can if you overdo it. Gloss medium might be more to your liking. And if it's too glossy, when you're done with it, Tim, you can by using cold wax. It's it's a wonderful uh, substance that I use. And I just take a a soft cloth and kind Mm. of buff the painting with that cold wax. And uh, that works very nicely too. So, Try the different, what I might suggest, Tim, is you get two or three different mediums and experiment. Just what do you like? And then I would probably have you get some uh, wax, which is really helpful. And then I use some varnish in my paintings, which really helps with the sheen. I did it on this painting behind me. You can even see the light play on this thing. And I do want to invite here other artists to chime in to um, the chat if you have other experiences or pre- pre- yes, preferable by all yeah, means. Um, mediums. By all means. Put it in the chat so you can also, mm. you know, learn from each other and yeah, we have one right and there. See, one. see what other people are using. Because yeah. there's many ways to do a thing. There's not just only one yeah. right way. In fact, we got a tip here, Tim, from Helen. Thank you, Helen. First layer of medium should be gloss to bring out the color. Do a matte if you want to kick down the sheen. Right. Yeah. Someone else likes golden satin glazing medium. You see, please write that down because I might buy yeah, some. Yeah, I, I know. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm learning from the, you know, I, for everything I know, there's a lot that I don't know. Mm. Uh, Thank you. You've been very helpful. I, at least I'm heading in the right direction. <laughs> I'm so sorry that you had to move away from oils, but I'm sure someday you'll return. 
Oh, I will. No, I'm not going to give up on oils at all. I love them. <laughs> and it's nice to meet your, um, I'm going to go on a limb and say wife. I don't know. Um, yes, Jan. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, the, the course, Tim did the course in the summer and then he bought it for me for Christmas. But I'm still working full time. So I'm working through it at snail's pace, but I'm really enjoying it. So thank you. Yeah. Well, enjoy. Take your, yeah. And take your time with it. There's no rush. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. So nice to see you again, guys. Thanks, Tim. There are uh, more questions now about. More questions. We'll go down a little bit. Uh, how can I use oil sticks yeah. or? Oh, I'm sorry. Do you use retarder to slow down uh, drying? Hi, Barbara. Nice to see you. If you want to hop in here quickly, um, the answer is I do use retarder to slow down the drying time of acrylics because, as you know, they they can so quickly. Um, and so that can help, especially if you're mixing quite a bit of paint. Uh, if you put too much of it in, you have to be careful because it can diminish the body of the paint and the saturation. But by all means, I do that. And sometimes I even use a spritzer with water just to keep them from drying out. Mm -hmm. How can I use oil sticks on an acrylic painting on canvas from Renee? Uh, hi, Renee. Um, oil stick, I like using oil stick. I prefer, uh, I work not on canvas. I haven't done it for years. I work on wood panel which I like because it has a resistant surface and I can really get in there with the oil stick. So if you're working on canvas, there's more give obviously. And so you won't, you know, you won't be able to be as forceful as you may want to be, but you can certainly do it and try. Some people will even put, will stretch canvas on panel so that it's, they're working on canvas, but they get a nice resistant from the board. And so mm -hmm. that's something else to consider. So once I put that down, um, and what if I don't like it? Can I take that off or is oil, it? Oil stick, once you, once you make a move yeah. with the oil stick on the. Um, yes. Uh-huh. Well, sort okay. of. <laughs> uh, <laughs> however, uh, this is um, a situation as an artist. But you're doing oil on acrylic. Yes. Oh, you well, you, be able to wipe it you off, might huh? be, it depends on how much you put down. You might be able to wipe it up. You might be able to get a rag and start wiping it up. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. should a little bit of thinner to do that. A little, solvent, yeah. uh, a little bit of solvent to lift it off. So the answer, but you have to be careful that you don't kind of smear and smudge it onto the existing surface and paint. Um, otherwise, you know, you're uh, as a painter, then the other uh -huh. thing, okay, we make a move, right? The move doesn't work for us. Well, now what? Well, we make another move and then we make another move <laughs> and we try to make Work. That's the other part of the answer. Okay, thank you. You are, you're welcome, Renee. It's good to see you. It's not always easy to erase, like you would erase a pencil mm -hmm. from the paper, and even no. that will leave a trace sometimes. Yep. And then there are materials that will leave a little bit more of a trace, especially if you have a lot of texture underneath. Yep. And, yeah. But I will say that when I erase with a pencil or I'm scraping, sometimes we scrape paint, all of that becomes a move. And it yeah. could be useful. You get these happy accidents like, oh, I'm erasing and oh, look at that smeary, smudgy area. That's kind of nice. I'm going to keep a little bit of that. So it just depends. You have to always mm -hmm. figure out what might be. And we're getting here suggestions, baby, baby wipes. wipes. So there you go. Baby to wipes and then you can sand. And then sand it slightly. Yeah. From uh, Aram. Good. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Good. Baby wipes. Give it a shot. <laughs> Thank you. Do that. All right. All if right. Collages. If you put collages on the acrylic paint, what kind of medium are you using? Putting it also on top. Right. Yes. So when I collage with what I do, I use matte medium primarily. I use matte medium three times. I put it on the surface. I put it on the back of the piece. Put it down. Then I put it on the top. So three times, and then I squeegee it. That's how I work on my own work. Now. Um, some, sometimes if I have heavier paper, I will use uh, a, 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 not matte medium, Base. but a matte gel, yeah. uh, which is thicker and it really does it well with thicker pages. And I do the same thing, surface, back of the piece, top of the piece, and then squeegee off. All right, so I, uh, no more questions right now. And I would no like question. to- um, Dive in? Yes, go into the conversation, the topic of today, which is, what is it, what does it mean to be your own best teacher? 
So Marie and I take evening walks around sunset. And last night we brainstormed about today's session with this topic. And we came up with a few bullet points, if you will. What we would like to do is just say them to you, our thoughts uh, of many, and then have people think about them and respond. Does that seem yeah. fair and reasonable? Yeah. So one of the first um, thoughts I had was um, I'm working on language and design, ongoing project, and I'm using, one of the books I'm using is a text by Nathan Goldstein. And here's a quote that he has at the beginning of his textbook. He says, the test of a design's book's value should be in how well it helps us create works that express our purposes, not in how well it helps us to do the exercises at the end of each chapter. Now, I love that because I would also say the purpose of taking a workshop, going into a class or working with an instructor is how well that work helps us create work of our own that expresses our purposes, not in how well it helps us do a certain exercise or project. Mm -hmm. The exercise or the project that's given to us, let's say, either by a textbook or by an instructor or class, that's just the beginning. Well, what am I saying? Well, if you're gonna be your own best teacher, then the exercise or the project is not the end. It would be the beginning of many other, um, how shall I say this, many other um, ways to do that exercise. And that involves you having to be imaginative and being thoughtful about, well, what else can I do with this curious. project and curious, the curiosity. And I can't teach curiosity, but, and that's, again, that's an inside job. So that's one aspect of being your own best teacher is to take a project, an idea, a scheme, whatever, and really run with it in your own way. You have some thoughts too. Well, you you have uh, your you have own a of bullet points here. So if you want to, Go we kind of these. try to create, you know, a few ideas. What would be Mark's tips and ideas on how to become your own best, best teacher. teacher? So shall I go a few more then? Yeah. And then Maria has some thoughts. Mm -hmm. So another thing, uh, in my own experience, I had great teachers in college and so on, but I really did a lot of my own personal investigation. So for instance, I never really learned perspective, one and two and three point perspective in college that well. I had one teacher who showed it to us, but he didn't spend much time. So I had to go out get a book and learn it on my own. You know, I did that. When I was asked by my college years ago to teach anatomy, I was a little bit terrified because I never even took anatomy, never even took it. And they wanted me to teach it. I had done a lot of figure drawings. So I said, okay, I went to the instructor who was um, the, the master of anatomy who was retiring. I was supposed to fill his shoes and I was terrified. He said, Mark, it's going to be brilliant. Just go out, build up your library on anatomy, start working and at least stay two chapters ahead of your students. <laughs> And that's what I did. And I'm still learning anatomy. I'm still learning it. So it's about taking the effort to just figure out, well, what, did it, what, what is it to be my own best teacher? And I'll say one more thing, I think, at least one more thing. I am, uh, when I conduct my classes or my workshops, I do a lot of research, both in my own personal library and online. Online is a remarkable resource, as you well know. Let me give you all a tip about how to build your own virtual library of art, artists, and art movements. It's actually pretty simple. Let's say you want to find out more about African-American women artists that are contemporary. You see, let's be clear. The art field was dominated by men for centuries. So me as a teacher, I'm always wanting to dig deeper. So I just type in contemporary African-American painters, women, Female. men, whatever. And all these names can come up. I click onto a name, I go to image, and I like it or I don't like it. And then I go to the next and I go to the next. I did this with so many workshops, so many slideshows, so many lectures I had to do. And I have now a virtual library in my computer of lots of great art and I'm constantly finding and discovering new artists, Asian artists, contemporary. I didn't have a clue, type it in, they all pop up. So in this way, the artist can get really stimulated because we want to be stimulated. This is how we keep our work fresh, new, interesting, and we want to be connected, connected to others and what they're doing. It gives us ideas, it gives us inspiration, it gives us connection. 
Yeah, and then you had a few more um, here, bullet points. Um, so a little learn, bit of what's happening right now. And then working with other artists. I have here, learn from other artists, create a small group, even if it's two or three others. We just got an email today, this morning. Yes. Do uh, you want to share that quick story? Uh, yes, one of the artists, I don't know if she's here, so I'm, I'm, I'm not going to mention her name unless she's here and she wants to pop in. She was I'm here. Hi, I'm Beth. Hi, Beth. Hi. Well, you your own experience, so I don't have to do it. Because your email this morning, was it this morning we got it? Yeah, well, we read it this morning. We read it at the breakfast table, and we said, well, these, these two are doing just what we want to talk about. They're being their own best teachers by taking something and running with it. Right. So basically, um, the, the way I'm taking this class with a friend is instead of uh, doing it week by week, we're doing it video by video. So we do one video a week, which is, you know, it's, it's not much. It's a sort of mixed prismatic greens, let's say. And we take a whole week on that. And we mix the greens um, and do the assignment the way you say to do it. But then um, we've, we, we made a, a, a decision beforehand that every time we mix colors, we would also show um, each other our, our mixing and then um, present each other with one, choose one piece of art, painting, a painting um, that uses say the prismatic greens. And we have to take a part of that painting or the whole thing, but we usually take a, just a section that is interesting to us of that painting and copy it um, using our prismatic greens. And we have to have that done every Tuesday night and we meet for about two hours. But it, 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 so it, it lets us dig really deep into using um, what you're giving us on a, just a regular basis. And let me tell you, sometimes we have bad weeks and it's just like, it's a mess. It's just a mess. And sometimes we have great weeks and it's so exciting. It's like the best thing ever. So, um, and I'm new to painting and I'm doing it all in watercolor. So that's another thing, but it's really challenging me to, you know, we have so many colors in watercolor. Oh my, all the yellows, you know, 20 yellows, so many different brands of the same color yellow, but I'm learning my chemical makeup of, you know, that Hansa yellow medium is the same as same chemical makeup as Windsor and Newton, you know, uh, uh, whatever, um, lemon yellow, you know, so, and, but just, so um, anyway, we're, we're and she's painting in oils um, and we're learning a lot from each other with both of those, but it's working, it's totally working. We're having a blast, so. It was so it was so serendipitous, uh, Beth, that we read your uh, yeah. your uh, communication. Well, she sent it because of this. Of the topic of this, of, of it's just this perfect. Talk. So I appreciate what you have to share. Look, artists are the best support system for other artists. You know, of all the support systems that are out there, artists are the ones. And so, by connecting with even one or two other people, let alone a group, it's just tremendous. Right. Well, and one one thing I didn't one thing I didn't say is that um, we don't know each other. We took a different painting class um, with you know twenty people in it. None of us knew each other from all over the United States and the world, um, just like this. And um, we we were the two loudest, most obnoxious people in the class. We it was a very serious class, so it didn't take much. <clears throat> and we um, did laughed a lot and made a lot of jokes and everyone sort of sat there and stared at us. And so after the class, we all had each other's emails. She emailed me and said, let's, let's do another class, but just you and me, let's find a class. And we had um, a woman in the class before the class ended had recommended your class um, and Jamie, and she took it in person with you. Um, I think a while ago, and I think she's taken several from you, but anyway. Um, yeah. So it, it's a great connection. You know, these classes can be, um, a great way to do something like that. Yeah. Well, thanks so much, yes. Beth. It was really great. And uh, I've seen a couple of questions here. Um, one question has to do with a favorite book on anatomy, which I'll tell you a little bit later on. I won Bible, but I think Turian's question is interesting. Could I do the final seven projects my own way instead of making the nine equal squares? Well, the short answer is yes, by all means. A longer answer is, why don't you try it my way, see what you can gain from that, and then take the ball and run with it. That would be the other part of the answer. Yeah. So, so, Maria has some thoughts as well, and then we'll open it up. How's that? Yes. Um, I, I did want to say two things. One, uh, which I really liked, a different take on teaching, learning and teaching um, from my yoga teacher, who I love a lot, um, Judith Lasseter. And 
she says that as yoga teachers, you know, we, uh, we think that when we go to a class and you teach a class, that's when you do your yoga practice. But she says, no, when you do your yoga practice in your own house, room, studio, kitchen, doesn't matter. You're actually doing it for your students because that's what you're going to teach. You can only teach from your own experience from what you not only learn, but assimilate and accept and adopt and embody as your own. And then when you go to teach a class, that's what you're doing actually for yourself because you as a teacher teaching others, you're learning, you're constantly learning and enriching yourself from that experience. So I love that as just a different yeah. way of thinking about the whole teaching and learning process and how it's, it's a back and forth, it's a dance. And the other thing, because we have had um, artists write us, contact us, and even in the yoga world where I, you know, kind of am more, um, there is a certain point of diminishing return in the process of learning from others. And that's the other thing that I kind of wanted to just put out there because you are taking, most of you, I'm guessing, are taking the workshop from Mark and learning. So you chose Mark as your teacher for now. You're learning from Mark. But then I know that many people do all kinds of workshops. And I know people who just constantly do workshops. And sometimes I think that there is a point of diminishing return when we're taking from others and we lose ourselves in the process. And so for me, I think what's really kind of the key and, and part of being your own best teacher is also to know when to stop and step back and say, okay, I've learned all these things from other people, but where am I in all of this? In all of this? What resonates with me? What doesn't? How can I make this my own? How can I really stick with it, stay with it, practice it, do the work so that I can call it my own and feel it in my own skin as part of myself and not as me doing what someone else is, is doing. Yeah. And uh, just the other day, um, we, Mark has a, um, what we call her a friend, and we would just, you know, we now visit each other and she took Mark's workshops and, and her work resembled a lot Mark's work. But then recently she changed it and we were so happy because Mark said, oh, okay, good. Now she's Found her path. out of my shadow and she's moving on, moving forward and changing and making uh, it her own. So. That was kind of what I wanted to yeah. put it out there as my two cents worth. It's important to not lose yourself. Yeah. And that reminds me of a quote by Baudelaire. He says, she was at once all the books she had read and all the art that she had looked at and was still profoundly original. So we need to go to resources and even be influenced by others. But as Matisse said, we need to, if we're going to be influenced by others, we need to pit our personality against the other. And that's how we find ourselves. And that takes quite a while. Yeah. yeah. So let's open it up, shall we? If anyone has any thoughts. Sure. Uh, and yes. People are also putting in the chat. So yes, let's, uh, I want to, I want to see if anyone wants to chime in. Um, yes, any please. thoughts that are coming, you know, or your own experiences, maybe the challenge of, of being your own best teacher. Are you, are you not, are you, you know, is, is anyone struggling with that? Mm -hmm. Whoever feels comfortable. You Unmute your mic and, and chime in. Hello. Hi there. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, Hi, nice to see you. Yes. I just, just really back on what you just said, uh, how much I valued the uh, experiential learning. So, you know, you can watch the videos and watch you doing it. And, you know, I've got books on colour that I've not, I thought I understood, but clearly I haven't. What I found so beneficial is just the process of, of doing it and seeing the change in front of me in the paint. You know, I can't, it sounds so obvious, but um, there is only one way to, to learn it is to actually do it. Exactly. And through all our missteps, our mistakes, our failures, the things that don't work out for us, uh, those are so critical to our success and to our learning. They are not impediments, they are essential. Yeah, it's just that the, the just the the challenge of like you know putting too much painted, too much of a a, a dark color in, and you realize oh I put way too much in there. You know I've learned so much about how little you need to change a color, yes. and um, just just the the value of like the raw umber exercise I did the other day, which was like 
yeah I loved it it was mind-blowing you know it's like wow I'm going to use that in my next painting you know so I'm not at the stage of actually taking the learning and applying it to the paintings yet but I know that when I do I will have this understanding now that I, I didn't have before and I've understood it by actually doing it not just by watching someone else or reading a book about it so that's just been so valuable yeah thank you <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. Well said. Thank you so much, Jane. Is anyone feeling challenged right now with the process of becoming your own teacher? Is anyone feeling lost right now? Anyone in this group feeling like I'm doing all these things, but I just, I don't know. I, I'm just doing them, but I don't know where I am. Is anyone challenged with that aspect? And obviously feels comfortable sharing. One way of saying this problem that people struggle with is I constantly am hearing from my students at the college, they're, they don't know about their style. They, they, want, they want to create their own style, their own unique voice. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting issue. And I'm sure there might be some folks out there who wonder about, well, what is my style? After all, I've been doing these different things, working with different people. And whether you're new at it or you've been at it for a while, sometimes this crops up like, you know, what's authentic for me? And, uh, I think that's an interesting question to which there's no specific answer uh, other than the fact that, um, and here's my own quote. I have a lot of quotes from others, but my own quote is this, all the answers to all your questions lies in doing all your work all of the time. <laughs> and that's a big part of it. Just doing it um, all the time. And then so many questions get answered. That's, that's how I feel. I saw Deborah, your mic. I also uh, see Jeanne. So Jeanne, I'm going to mute you for a moment and I'm going to let okay. Deborah jump Speak. in first Good. and then we'll go to you. Deborah, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say one, how I keep revisiting the class I signed up originally and then I worked back through it and now I'm I, I've kind of parsed little pieces of it that I want to continue to revisit. Um, and that whole thing about what is my style, what I find is um, uh, I, that just hit a perfect note for me right now, because I find that I'm really resisting something that is just appealing to me. And it's just because, well, it doesn't seem to be, it, it seems to be, unsophisticated. That's what it is. You know, I have this thought and I think that's where we get stuck with things like uh, that, you know, it has to be a certain way that there has to be a sophisticated way to approach your art. Um, and I am really um, attracted to uh, very clean design, um, graphic, I would say even graphic and to be very colorful. And yet when I get in with my stash of papers and pieces, I, I just start creating these things that I'm like, where the hell did that come from? And why am I wasting my time doing it? And yet, you know, there's something there that I, is playful. I want to take out thread and toothpicks and stitch them and put them in there. And I'm like, why are you going down that rabbit hole? So, um, yeah, I think your, your advice, Mark, is perfect in the sense that you just need to turn up every day and persist and, and trust that you may not, not, I think you said it the other day, it's like it's process, not product, or there was something that I was seeing of yours, process, not product. And the fact that um, I have to honor that little part of me that just wants to be playful and whimsical and not sophisticated. And I have to see where that takes me. But I'm highly resistant to it right now. I find every day I go into the studio and I'm doing battling with my shoulds. So that's it. That's it for me. <laughs> I'm going battle. I, I think of Joseph Campbell, this wonderful author who wrote about myth and myth making. And years ago, he had an interview and he said, um, it was Bill Moyers who was interviewing him, asking him for some advice. He, and he said at one point, and this became a famous uh, quote from uh, Joseph Campbell, follow your bliss. 
And that used to be like the quote from the 70s or, you know, follow your bliss. And I, I believe there's some truth there. Yeah. Yeah. But that's the biggest challenge. That is too. the biggest challenge. The shoulds, the battle of the shoulds. Yes. I'm going to make a t-shirt of that. The battle of the <laughs> shoulds. That is really brilliant. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you for sharing. Yes, John, yeah. let me, um, I'm going to mute other mics for now. And uh, John, did you want to hop in, John Lacasse? There we go. Yeah. There I am. I didn't know I was supposed to unmute. Um, I just wanted to touch on the thing about um, finding your voice. I know that I do a lot of experimentation, like trying new materials. And you know, it's, I constantly have the what if, what if I do this, what if I do that, even if it's within the old cold wax realm where I mainly reside. Um, but I have found that there are times when I just, it just doesn't feel authentic to me. And that's when I know that I'm, it's not that I'm afraid to step out of the safety zone, but I know when I'm just, there's something in my gut that says, okay, this isn't me. It's a hard thing to describe, but it's kind of a visceral feeling that I get. And then I just kind of walk away from it. And conversely, when I'm in my zone, you know, when I'm like cranking, it just, it's kind of like a symphony, you know, it's just, okay. And it's not that you don't have road bumps or where you don't feel so you've made a mistake or you need to walk away and come back to something. I, I hope I'm kind of saying this in a, a way that's understood. And, and then the other thought was in terms of, uh, I was thinking about, you know, the question was how to be your own teacher. And I was thinking about two things when it comes to classes that I've taken or, or teachers that I've studied with is that someone told me years ago, and I think she might've been a teacher at one point. She said, the mark of a good teacher is the person who can meet the students where they are. Yes. Absolutely. And and then, of course, for many artists, um, I think one of the key things for us to uh, a part of being a good teacher is to not criticize, get that monkey off your shoulder. It's more of a question of analyzing your work and then figuring out what's working, what isn't working, rather than the little critic that sits on the right shoulder and just can ruin your <laughs> life. <laughs> or your day in the studio. Well said. Yes, and I totally think that, that that applies for other people being the teacher or ourselves being the teacher to someone else, but also being yeah. ourselves. ourselves. Where can I meet myself where I am and be comfortable with that and not ask of myself to be somewhere else where I think I should be, right? Yeah. right. And if I could add a layer to this, uh, Jean, or is it Jean or Jean? Jean. Either one. <laughs> layer to this yesterday i had a conversation with a good friend of mine jeffrey and he asked me at one point he goes i've been meaning to ask you he's a musician not an artist he said uh, i've been meaning to ask you mark in your process of working or painting uh, do you ever feel like you're a vehicle for something else a greater force or what have you and i said well let me answer it this way i know what you're talking about but let me answer it this way i find that when i'm in the practice if i can get lost in the moment really, truly lost in the moment, all the voices start to, uh, the voices that are in my head, they start to go away. The voices of doubt, the voices of judgment, the voices of fear, or as you say, critical, and I just get lost in the moment. And it doesn't really matter if I'm doing well or not, it's just I'm lost. And in those moments, I think I'm finding myself because the voices just start to go away. And that, yeah. But I added to Jeffrey, this is a glimpse. It happens very quickly and it doesn't sustain because right. the I'm creeping back in because we have the monkey mind, as the Easterns say. And there we are. <laughs> yes, the battle of the, the doubts the and the, the shoulds the and shoots. the battle of the voices. Yeah. There's one other on, on that same line of thinking or experience. There have been, and I'm sure it's happened to every single artist. There have been some times, and like you said, it's like, a momentary experience. I mean, sometimes it's like a millisecond, maybe a little bit longer, 
where it's almost an out of body experience. And it's happened to me only a few times. And when it does, I just sit there, I go, oh, I wish I could just bottle this and make it last forever. (laughs) The first time it happened to me, it took me quite by surprise. But now when it does happen, I just savor it. Yeah, Lost in the moment. And that's what we, in in the yoga world, we say, you know, we, we, we become one with everything. But I think that really what happens is that we become one with ourselves. We are just yeah. there yeah. in our own. Fully present. Fully present, fully present, whatever it is, but with yourself. And that's when yeah. you feel you are who you are, part of the whole, right? Yeah. Doesn't matter if it's through art or through cooking or yeah. through doing yoga yeah. or through whatever. Yeah. Music. Yeah. Yeah. Well, wonderful. Yes. Thank you so much, Thank John. you, John. So, so I did see, I, I had to mute uh, someone who's, um, one quick second, yes, I want to grab a book. whose name was just iPad, um, Victor. Okay, I see you. And then whoever's name is, I'm sorry, I had to move this, um, iPad. So you're going to be next. So yes, Victor, Mark is just going to grab a book, um, but he's right here. He can hear you. So um, I, I struggle a little bit with finding a voice. Um, I'm not quite sure what the voice is. But I find that my biggest struggle is um, trying to explain what a painting is beside it being a painting. Um, and I, I'm, I listen to people talk about their work and, and it's, to me, it's like La La Land. You know, a painting is a painting in this world, especially in this COVID world. Um, going back to what you said, I get lost mixing a red and an orange for God knows how long. And it's, you know, it's an epiphany, but, you know, explaining that to somebody or explaining the lines and, and a painting is, is a painting. So that's my big issue and how, how to deal with that. Uh, an artist once famously said, and I don't know who it was, but I remember the quote, it, I remember it as a undergraduate student. He had an exhibition of his work. Someone came up to him and asked him, what is it? All about or what does it mean or help me understand it and he famously said i would be a poor father if i had to speak for my children um, which i always love now that's one school of thought the other school of thought is that there are those who can speak volumes about their work um when i'm asked let's say i have an exhibition and someone's saying well what does this painting mean to you my God, what a loaded question, right, Victor? It's like, where do you start? And, and, and I want to say to them, well, I'll tell you what, if you spend some time with this painting, close up, far away, I would urge you to spend an hour with this painting. And that's what I would urge you to do. And then come back and, and I would ask you, what do you see from this painting? It's really the viewer's responsibility, by the way. Yeah. Once the painting is out of the studio, or let's say the viewer is looking, the responsibility does not lie with the artist. The artist has done his or her work. Then the responsibility is with the viewer to spend the time, to have the interest, to have an inquisitive eye. It's not with you to explain it. If, if someone needs to be explained, well, okay, try to have that conversation. But I'm with hmm. you mostly on this one, Victor. Right. And now that you mentioned <clears throat> that quote, I just remember... Louis Armstrong at, was asked by somebody, what is this jazz all about? And he just turned to him and said, well, if you're asking, you'll never understand it. And I guess, so I uh, thank you. And I just will ignore and say, you have a look at it. Just sit down. Here's, here's a chair. Sit down. I'll okay. come back. I'll bring the donuts. They bring the donuts. <laughs> also, Bryce Martin, who is one of my favorite paintings, he painters, he does these paintings that are calligraphic. They have lines and color that move all over the place. Someone asked him about the same question. He said, look, just follow one of my marks and, and, <laughs> and, and you'll understand. So You're right. They have to okay. Re- right. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Victor, thank you. Nice Victor. to see you again. Yeah. Thanks. I, um, Yes, I see iPhone. Yes. And I want to just to acknowledge that it's 11 o'clock. Yeah. But uh, let me ask you guys and you can type in the chat. Um, we can go over maybe 10, 15 minutes. Yes. Think, Mark? But before, Is that okay? Yeah. That's, so let's, that's fine uh, by me. Yeah. All right. Yes. 
Okay. Are you okay to to stay? If you need to leave, it's going to be recorded and please do. Okay. So let's um, stay another 15 minutes. Um, Okay. okay, So whoever's name is iPhone. (laughs) Oh, that's me. (laughs) Uh, That's Jane. Jane Pryor. I'm in Cambridge. Hi. Can you hear me? We can very well. Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, I just wanted, it was very brief, but it fitted in with what you're, you've been saying, that um, I'm an abstract painter, and I've been that for a long time. And um, I've been through all sorts of uh, different uh, modes of being an abstract artist, um, and felt like I was kind of making lots of imitations of abstract paintings. And um, finally, I arrived at this point where I didn't have to explain, I just felt I didn't need to explain what the work was about and it was okay for it just to be and it could just be itself. And, and it was a huge liberation when I realized that. Um, and it was okay for it to, to just be color. Um, and that was fantastic to, And it, it just allowed me to get on with my work, really. Um, I felt like I hadn't got all these people sitting on either of my shoulders saying yeah but Jane what does it mean (laughs) Um, and it was it was great so I just encourage people to put all those things down and just do the work (laughs) well said yeah my my favorite way of um giving other people the opportunity um to think is when they ask me you know what does it mean to you I just I just reflect back and well what does it mean to you Yes. It's a nice, gentle, polite way to just flip it around and allow that person to have their own moment of reflection. Yeah. Instead of me feeding mm-hmm. them my own thoughts or my own ways, allowing them to come to their own yeah. whatever. For the, long- yeah. Yeah. For the longest time I did not title my work. Because I did not want the viewer to, I did not want to bring an association to the piece because they're abstract. Um, now, if I do title a piece, I try to make it very sort of obscure so that the viewer still <laughs> has his or her ability to whatever associations they want to make. Mm-hmm. Yes, and we were talking about... I've taken to using... Sorry, I was going to just chip in there. I've taken to using fairly random titles that I almost have just a list and I pick something out randomly and nice. stick okay. it on the painting and... It somehow over time, the painting um, takes on that title. Um, I don't know how it works, but it it just goes away on its own somehow, the painting and the title together, and they form this bond that's, I don't know why it works, but it does somehow. (laughs) That That is really, yeah, uh, that's another way to do it, I think. Yeah, Yeah. randomness. Randomness. I like randomness. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so Thank much. You. So uh, yes, and the other thing we were talking okay. about um, last night was responsibility. Um, I love the word responsibility because it usually has this negative connotations, like oh, you know, I'm responsible, or someone is giving me the responsibilities. It's like scary. It's uncomfortable. It's a lot of responsibility. But I love thinking of responsibility coming from response. And in order to have a response, a response, it's a choice. So we respond, the the way we respond, it's because we gave ourselves that opportunity, responsibility to make a choice, to take a choice and then to communicate it back. Mm -hmm. So I love um, the idea of um, being your own best teacher, being your responsibility. You're responsible for your own progress your own learning it's not always just the responsibility of the teacher and someone just pour stuff in your head it becomes your own responsibility to respond to what you're receiving in your own unique way so I like playing a little bit with that word responsibility and I think that every great teacher will actually give that responsibility because it's power it is empowerment so giving the responsibility to the student to figure it out for himself or for herself instead of me telling you how to do certain thing so that you do it just like me and you're going to be fine. No, that's not the way. As Jean mentioned, meeting the student or yourself where you are 
and giving you the responsibility, the space, the security, the support to then become who you need to become and who yeah. you need to be. I think that's uh, just, I wanted to chime in with that. And I had a thought too, Maria, about this idea of being your own best teacher. From my own experience, one of the things that I have done over the years, starting all the way back, was to choose my teachers mm -hmm. that I wanted to work with. When I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Barbara, there were teachers I did not want to work with. Uh, they were too lax, et cetera. And others who were taskmasters or I really wanted to learn from them, I sought them out. I interviewed with them. Uh, same thing all the way through. I made choices about which schools I wanted to go to and which teachers and artists I wanted to work with. And I think that people out there are also doing that with the workshops and other artists. And if you're going to college, whatever, any school, or even just choosing someone to work with, you know, that, that becomes a choice. Yes. That becomes part of being your own best teacher. Those artists you want to work with. Mm -hmm. And, and then as you like to say, and then getting out of that shadow. And then getting out from underneath that shadow. You yeah. gotta, you gotta get out from underneath that shadow of the great tree. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, let me see if anyone else wants to chime anything that is coming to mind, anything you want to share. We have about five or 10 minutes more depending. I'm going to meet you where you are. So <laughs> I'll work with you here. Yeah. If anyone else feels the need to talk, communicate, share. Yeah. Did you want to um, share the well, book? Before I us? forget, if the person yeah, who but... asked about anatomy book, because I did mention anatomy, is out there still, but this is recorded. Um, I have a whole shelf filled with books of anatomy and I have a few favorites, but this is the Bible. I just got this within the last year. And if you have only one book on anatomy, this is all you need because there's a lifetime of learning right here. The author is Gott, um, Gottfried Bams, B-A-M-M-E-S. It is the complete guide, and trust me, it is complete. The complete guide uh, of anatomy for the artist. And you won't need another book. Um, I'm gonna spend the rest of my life trying to get through half of this thing, if maybe a quarter. <laughs> But this is the this is the Bible as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. All right. So um, I think I'm gonna wrap it up. Okay. Um, and it's eleven eleven for once. Good moment. Um, anything you want to share for the just how much I've enjoyed this community and as always we urge people to stay in touch with us. But there was a question about whether I'm available to critique work. And the short answer is no, I'm really not. Um, I'm so sorry, but uh, we're so busy right now, right, right now, me and with my own studio practice and putting together a language of design, which is gonna be many, many moons uh, ahead of us. So unfortunately I'm not available for that, but I appreciate you asking. Let me uh, just to wrap it up. I want to just hear from you one more time in the chat. So if you would sum up just what you heard, maybe you had an aha moment, just, you know, the light bulb came up and something that really resonated with you. If you could type in the chat, like one word, what word comes up after our hour of discussion? Put it in there. Reassurance. Okay, let's see. What is that one word? Self-starter. Self -starter. Trust. Trust. Mm -hmm. Teaching. Freedom. Explore. No, Trust, relief, do the work. Persistence. Inspiration. Response. Mm -hmm. Good words. Space. You're Believe. welcome, Corey. Believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like seeing this. What What are you taking Trust, away? Perseverance, flow, response. Response. Yeah. Yeah. I do love this community. We do intend to stay connected and, and please. Uh, Be humble. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stay in touch with us via communication, email, what have you. Yep. Yeah. All right, so I want to put a gallery view. I want to see all the beautiful smiling faces right. before we say hi. Look at that. <laughs> I saw Jean. I saw Jean. Love seeing you. Love seeing you. Thank you so much for being with Regina. us. Um, we will probably do more of these, but for now we're gonna wrap it up and uh, go back into the studio, do our own work, learn from our own experiences. Yes. And stay in touch. Uh, if you're in the language of color, hop into the Facebook yeah. group. There's a lot of support and learning from each other in that group. Um, otherwise, keep an eye on the newsletter for further chats. And I would finally add that, and I don't know any Italian, Maria is learning it, but this is not goodbye. This is arrivederci, <laughs> which we'll see you in the future. <laughs> So, Irina, <laughs> goodbye. Arrivederci. We'll see you in the future. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Bye.
time, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. Ciao. Work hard and <laughs> work hard. And have fun. And <laughs> work hard and have fun. That's the deal. <laughs>